we have been having superb series of speakers about all the issues that are relating to justice and home affairs um, over the last, particularly in the last five years where things are changing so fast. But today we're particularly honoured to have um, a speaker who is um, known to many of us because he was ambassador here from the UK and um, he then has gone on to do other things since he was in Ireland. But in August 2016, Commissioner uh, President Juncker nominated our speaker today, Julian King, in the post of the Commissioner for the Security Union. Now, this is a new commissionership and a whole new area of policy that has been um, given this kind of, I suppose, notoriety of having its own commissioner. And um, uh, Julian, as the commissioner, uh, comes with a great deal of experience, having worked both in the Northern Ireland office, worked in the Director General of Economic and Consular Affairs in the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, British Ambassador here, um, UK representative on the EU Political and Security Committee. So obviously his choice by <coughs> President Juncker, he looked at his background and said, this is the guy we need. And Julian is going to talk to us today about the terrorist attacks and as gr the growth in terrorist attacks um, and the growth in cyber crime and cyber attacks. Here in the Institute, we have been <coughs> delving with that into that subject quite a bit with speakers because it is now a very serious threat to all our lives and um, some of us who are a bit older than some of the others in the audience are sort of still very confused about cyber crime and how it works we can manage our emails and we can manage a little bit of use of our computers but um, the depths to which people can get into the computer systems in the world and cause uh, terrorist attacks, cause electricity supplies to be cut off in whole countries. This is really frightening kind of stuff and it's almost stuff that we thought we'd never see in our lives. So Julian, we look forward to hearing a bit about what your job is and where you think uh, you can add to the safety and security of our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you um, uh, everyone who's here. Uh, I I'm going to use this opportunity then to talk about the, the two main security challenges uh, that we face uh, across the European Union, uh, which are, as you said, uh, terrorism and cyber. Uh, two days ago, uh, it was in St. Petersburg that we saw the latest uh, terrorist attack. Two weeks ago, uh, it was in London, of course. Uh, and the fact that the victims there, four innocents uh, and 50 injured, uh, came from... Uh, 11 different countries, I think, demonstrates again that this isn't simply an attack on one country or, a, or another. Uh, one of the injured, of course, was, was Irish, and another victim probably owes uh, his life to the fast-thinking response of an Irish woman who performed a CPR on him uh, on the spot until the emergency services arrived. Uh, London was struck on the same day uh, that in Brussels we were marking the first anniversary of the airport and metro attacks. Uh, France, where I was until last summer, uh, Belgium, Germany, uh, have all suffered in a two-year cycle of Islamist terror on European soil. Uh, these were attacks on our shared European values by people seeking to, to target and undermine our way of life. Uh, of course, the threat from terrorism is, is not new, uh, and many uh, countries across Europe have had to deal with it in, in the past. But the jihadi-inspired threat from Daesh is different, not only because it's global, uh, but also because of the way it targets our shared values and seeks to destroy our way of life. It's a threat that we, we must defeat. Uh, the risk, in fact, of a terrorist attack uh, is going to remain high in the coming months and years, uh, particularly as events in Syria, Iraq, and indeed Libya uh, unfold. Uh, the prospect that some foreign terrorist fighters will attempt to return to the EU with the intention of planning and executing future attacks. Estimates vary, but uh, around 2,000 EU citizens 
who traveled to fight with ISIS remain in Iraq or Syria. Keeping tabs on their whereabouts and movements is going to be a key challenge for member states, law and order agencies, and for the EU as, as a whole. And so too is how to respond to the new phenomenon of, as you called it downstairs, uh, low-cost terrorism, where, as in London, Nice, uh, and Berlin, all you need is a vehicle or a knife indiscriminately to inflict fatal injuries on innocent people uh, and those charged with protecting our safety. Last week's attack uh, fits into a, a pattern of behavior which has been encouraged by Daesh uh, via their online propaganda. It means the risk is not only about potential returning foreign fighters, we also need to be vigilant about efforts to radicalize within our own communities, to try to get vulnerable individuals to turn against our shared values and be drawn into violence. Indeed, we need to learn from each of these attacks so that we're able to turn yesterday's terrorist success into tomorrow's uh, terrorist failures. The recent low-tech attacks in Europe are particularly difficult to detect in advance, but there are some common factors, most notably that their inspiration was transnational. Most of the perpetrators were EU citizens or residents who had spent time in Syria or attempted at least to travel there. Uh, a smaller number of third country nationals were involved in some of these attacks. Almost all of the attackers had crossed the EU external border at some point prior to committing their attack. In response, at the European level, uh, we've moved to enhance security uh, of our external borders uh, with the revision of the Schengen Border Code, which means that everybody coming in and out of our shared space will be subject to a systematic security check, including EU passport holders. Uh, we're negotiating a new entry-exit system to reinforce border checks for third country nationals. A European-wide passenger name record system will make it easier to detect the movements of foreign terrorist fighters. Uh, and we've proposed a European travel information and authorization system, ETIAS, in order to gather information on people traveling visa-free to the European Union to allow for advanced migration and security checks. We're working to join up our EU information systems to uh, fight identity fraud and strengthen the hand of border and law enforcement agencies. As well as strengthening our controls of external borders and reinforcing the exchange of information between our law enforcement and security agencies, we are also criminalizing travel to and from uh, Iraq and Syria for wannabe terrorists. We're toughening the rules on money laundering, which can help finance terrorism. And we've agreed a, a deal on firearms, which will remove the most dangerous military-grade weapons from wider circulation. And we've also broadened the scope of legislation controlling the sale of explosive precursors. So with these measures, uh, we are making it harder for terrorists to travel, to train, to finance themselves, and to acquire weapons and explosives. But we won't defeat terrorism with databases and legal frameworks alone. We need to prevent the hate mongers from inciting people to commit violence in the first place. Much of this work is best done at the local level, led by grassroots and civil society organizations. But we can and we will do more at the EU level to support these efforts and make sure that we share best practice. The internet is a fertile ground for radicalization. Uh, data is on the front line of both our defense and our detection abilities. And we need the cooperation of social media and internet providers to help to detect those being radicalized in their bedrooms. Uh, we've set up the EU Internet Forum to help ensure that illegal content, for example, promoting Daesh, uh, is taken down by the internet companies. Uh, the Internet Referral Unit at Europol, uh, and I think you've had Rob Wainwright from Europol with you, uh, has, has actually referred uh, tens of thousands of posts to the internet companies uh, and enjoys a higher than 80% takedown rate. So we need to continue to build on that cooperation and to scale it up because tens of thousands is good, but there are hundreds of thousands of such um, material out there. Uh, and also to promote alternative 
positive messages. Frankly, there's more that the social media companies need to do to play their part in this fight. After all, if they can collect, analyze, and sell data about us for commercial and marketing purposes using their algorithms, they can do the same thing free of charge to help to counter terrorism. The internet provides uh, the link to the other major threat uh, that I want to talk about, which is cyber. If you ask me to sum up the cybersecurity threat that we currently face in one sentence, it would run something like this. Our society's dependence on connected technology is increasing faster than our ability to build defensive capabilities to protect it and ourselves. It's quite a sobering thought, particularly when you factor in that the rate of growth of cybercrime over the next two years is projected to be greater, faster, than the rate of growth of the use of the internet. So the criminals, at least, think that they're on to a good thing. While we've all become addicted to our smartphones, tablets, wireless printers, app control devices, surfing the wave of rapid technological advances and enjoying the giant leap forward in information accessibility, we have inadvertently been creating a massive vulnerability which cyber criminals and hostile states have not been slow to spot and to seek to exploit. Uh, when uh, the machines that we watch for our entertainment become smart enough to watch us back, uh, it's time perhaps to pause for thought about where this journey from analog to digital is actually taking us. Uh, as many as 21 billion devices used by business, consumers, you and me, uh, are forecast to be connected, unsecured, to the internet by 2020. Now, we need to do something to change this, uh, and it needs to be a shared responsibility, starting with individuals and going all the way up to international cooperation uh, between the private and the public sectors. In terms of individuals, while we are all used to reading about cyber attacks perpetrated against big corporations and celebrities, there is perhaps a certain complacency amongst us, the wider public, that our lives will not be affected. But in fact, what was once exceptional is rapidly becoming mainstream, and the tentacles of cybercrime are starting to reach into the daily lives of us all. It's time to fight back. It is, as often quoted, and therefore unfortunately often ignored, uh, the fact that 80% of cyber attacks can be defeated by 20 simple actions of cyber hygiene. Basic cyber hygiene is pretty boring, updating your software with security patches. But the more of us that make the effort, the harder the criminals will have to work. Uh, for example, in January of this year, security experts released data on the most commonly used passwords. To do that, they looked at over 10 million that have been subject to cybersecurity breaches. Depressingly, they discovered that 17% were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. In terms, in terms of the private sector, uh, we need to end the era of factory-set security codes, which is basically insecurity by design, by agreeing EU-wide standards for connected devices. And we need industry to invest in cybersecurity. The EU public-private partnership launched last year is expected to trigger 1.8 billion euros of investment in cybersecurity by 2020, which is excellent, except that the US is spending 18 billion euros on cybersecurity in 2017 alone. Looking at the threat, Europol's serious and organized crime threat assessment uh, of earlier this year reveals that almost all types of organized criminal groups are deploying and adapting technology with ever greater skill and to ever greater effect. It is now, perhaps, the greatest challenge facing law enforcement authorities around the world. The dark web, a collection of websites operating on an encrypted network hidden from traditional search engines and browsers, is the criminal's bazaar where, subject to the right introductions, it's possible to buy the latest malware or to rent a botnet for fairly modest sums, which can be used to launch a distributed denial of service attack that can, can and has paralyzed a whole network. 
So while the threats posed by cyber aren't entirely new, what is changing is their scale and their diversity. And the actors are not only criminals with ransomware, malware, and phishing for profit, but also state and non-state actors who see cyber as a valuable and deniable weapon. That's why at the European level, we need to work on two broad fronts. First, to reduce the likelihood of attacks by increasing the barriers to them and reducing the incentives to carry them out. Second, to reduce the impact of attacks through raising awareness and knowledge and through better system design. In practice, that means working to raise awareness, which is the first line of defense. So talking about this problem is part of the solution. Tracing and prosecuting cyber criminals, reinforcing resilience and security of our critical infrastructure and systems, particularly where they are enabled by IT, investing in research, working with the private sector, and building international cooperation and capabilities. And so just to finish, a few words about the elephant in the room. Uh, as I've said before, in my view, it's in everybody's interest that the UK and the EU continue to cooperate closely, both on counter-terrorism and on counter-cyber. We have a shared analysis of the threat and a shared interest in fighting it. But just because we all agree on the objective, it does not necessarily mean that it will be easy to achieve. There will be some legal and practical constraints to what can be done after the UK ceases to be a member of the EU. But we are undoubtedly better able to tackle these threats if we can find ways to continue to work together. Uh, on the wider issues raised by the UK's decision, uh, my colleague from the Commission, Franz Timmermans, was here in Dublin uh, about a month ago, and I agree with what he said and how he put it. Ireland is a special case in the Brexit equation. The European Commission will take its very special interests to heart and will make sure that those interests are heard by everyone during the coming negotiations. That's the position, and the Commission is united in this approach to the coming talks. Thank you. Thanks very for much indeed, and, and, and particularly for the, the ending of your speech there. We, we try not to have the whole thing just be about Brexit, because this is a wider topic. Uh, I, I'm always amused uh, here in the Institute. We keep hearing new expressions. You hear people getting haircuts and washing their face. To a new one today, cyber hygiene. I hadn't heard that expression before. Um, and it's an everyday word. Or we all mind our own hygiene. Now we have cyber hygiene. And um, I need to get hold, and we all need to get hold of the 20 things to do. I will recall a very short story when I did a little bit of work in TV3 and it was around the time all this um, hacking was, was going on in the UK with celebrities and everything and they were all saying, um, oh, I said, well, it's, it's easy done if people don't change the codes. So I asked one of the journalists for her phone number and I then proceeded to show her how I could hack her phone because she had never changed her, her 1234. I phoned in, put the five in front of her number, got to her voicemail and then put in 1234 and said, so-and-so is ringing you and has left a message, he wants to meet you later and something else. And she was absolutely appalled. And she was a journalist, you know, who was working in the system and she hadn't changed. So when we went around that room in the studio in TV3, there were about three people who hadn't, hadn't changed, and that was a very high percentage. So, I mean, I'm not going to ask anybody here who hasn't changed their code uh, to put their hands up, but if you haven't, please, as soon as you leave this room, make sure that you can't, that you have put your own particular number in. Um, and with regard to passwords, you know, we all tend to use um, the same ones very often the town we were born in or the town we're living in or the mother's maiden name and these kind of things so you just have to be careful about it thank you very much indeed for for um what is a, a warning to us all that that uh, the life has changed somewhat